Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to our panel session this morning on um, the material culture of the U.S. Coast Guard from flags to floaties. Um, uh, my name is Janet Pashuk. I'm the collections manager for the Coast Guard Heritage Asset Collection. Um, and we have our moderator. I'm also the panel chair this morning. Our moderator is Scott Price. He is Chief Historian of the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, I wanted to introduce you all to our Heritage Asset Collection a little bit first before we start our panelists' talks. Um, our collection consists of over 22,000 uh, accessioned artifacts and artworks representing the missions and operations of the Coast Guard and its predecessor agencies. Um, I work at the Coast Guard Exhibit Center, which is a 12,800 square foot uh, warehouse storage facility in Forestville, Maryland. And at that location, we have approximately 15,000 heritage assets uh, that we care for. Uh, we preserve and process and catalog and uh, make available for loans and exhibits uh, around the country. Um, we also have collections at the Coast Guard Academy, at the Coast Guard Museum. One of our presenters will be it works at the Coast Guard Museum, and she'll be talking about an artifact up there. Um, and then we also have thousands of artifacts on loan to various Coast Guard units and public maritime museums across the country. Um, we thought it would be interesting to have a panel on how 3D artifacts can illustrate history and truly bring the stories of the Coast Guard and Maritime Service to life. Um, this morning we have two presentations about uh, accession to Coast Guard artifacts um, that argue, arguably fall on the opposite spectrum, sides of the spectrum. One paper discussing a classic artifact to all military heritage collections, flags. We're all familiar with them. And, uh, their symbolism. The other, a modern, unconventional military artifact, the unicorn float. <laughs> Interestingly, both papers will dem demonstrate the commonality of concerns over preservation, display, and issues surrounding the scope of collecting, and questions about what makes an object an artifact or a heritage asset. They will also illustrate how two very different artifacts are symbolic and a motive of specific places, times, and events. Yet even when they are completely different in their materials of construction, age, and relation to Coast Guard life and service. Our first speaker today is Stan Contratus. Um, he is our museum technician volunteer at the Coast Guard Exhibit Center, which he's been doing for over seven years now, and we are fully indebted to him for his service. Uh, we wouldn't be where we are without him and all our volunteers. Um, Stan is a retired Air Force Colonel. He served for over 28 years in various capacities for the US Air Force, uh, including commanding five units domestically, overseas, and while deployed. He also served on various US and International Forces Headquarters staffs. Um, in addition to his museum technician position with us at the Coast Guard Exhibit Center, um, he, he works for a company called SPA, supporting a variety of DOD strategic programs uh, for various departments supporting combat commands. And yes, he gets paid in that position. <laughs> Other duties as assigned for Stan, and the list is pretty long. Um, he is vice president for the North American Vexillological Association board member of the Prince William County, Virginia Historic Preservation Foundation, volunteer exhibit designer at Pendleton County, West Virginia Historical Society, and he also serves on the Northern Virginia Community College Public History and Historic Preservation Advisory Board. Um, he has a BA in History, MA in Military Operational Art and Science, and uh, recently attained Certificate in Public History and Historic Preservation from Northern Virginia Community College. Please give Stan Contratus a warm welcome 
for his paper titled U.S. Coast Guard Heritage Asset Collections Historical Flags. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Janet. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, coming, as uh, Janet mentioned, to uh, to learn more about the Heritage Asset Collection that the Coast Guard has. Uh, We'll be taking a look at some of those associated challenges that Janet mentioned uh, during the, the uh, presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an overview uh, of what we'll be uh, covering. I'm, I'm going to touch very briefly on uh, various flags in the, in the collection and uh, talk and use that as a base to talk about some of the challenges that the staff has to consider when trying to preserve and store these artifacts. Next slide, please. Going to that emotive piece that uh, Janet mentioned, yeah, a moth-eaten rag on a worm-eaten pole does not look likely to stir a man's soul. Tis the deeds that were done neath the moth-eaten flag when the pole was a stack and the rag was a flag. This 1800s quote is meant to remind observers of flags, particularly historically important ones, that these objects are physical reminders of the service and sacrifice often associated with flags, particularly those associated with the armed services, like the Coast Guard. Flags are omnipresent pieces of material culture, and despite their fragile physical form, they have proven themselves powerful emotive symbols across millennia. From the totems and standards used thousands of years ago by the Assyrians and Egyptians, to the vexilla carried by Roman legions, to flags flown by early royal houses to identify their ships and warriors, modern flags are colorful representations of individuals and groups of people. The U.S. Coast Guard Heritage Asset Collection consists of modern-day objects, such as flags, as well as other objects from its various predecessor organizations across generations of service. The flags are stored at the Coast Guard's exhibit center, as Janet mentioned, and part of its 20,000 plus inventory. Many of the flags have fascinating histories, with some having physical scars from the role they played in Coast Guard history. We'll be covering the background of a representative sampling and discussing the myriad storage and preservation challenges of flags as historical textile objects. As an example, next slide please. These, uh, this is the Vexillum, uh, and that's where Vexillology comes from, uh, and that's uh, a standard on a uh, tomb engraving, uh, kind of considered the predecessor of modern flags. Next slide. Next slide, please. This is an example of what you don't want to do if you can all avoid it, and that is you don't want to fold your flags, stick them in a box, and, uh, uh, on a shelf. Next slide, please. Okay, embarking on our look at the collection, we come to an ensign and commissioning pennant from the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Grand Isle, hull number 1338 seen here, and named after Grand Isle, Louisiana. It was homeported in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Grand Isle was an island-class patrol boat of 110 feet, commissioned in 1991, decommissioned in 2016, and transferred to the Pakistan Navy's Maritime Security Agency. One of the cutter's most notable involvements is its claim to be the first of its class of cutters to cross the Atlantic. In this frame presentation piece, you'll see a U.S. Coast Guard ensign and a commissioning pennant flown on the Grand Isle during its 2000, 2003 Operation Iraqi Freedom deployment to the Mediterranean. Its mission was to seal off waterborne escape routes for Iraqi leaders fleeing the war through Syria and into the Mediterranean. When Syria agreed to close its borders, all the cutters were released and returned to the U.S. Next slide, please. The flags in the frame are of modern manufacture and commonly encountered with today's cutters and produced in nylon canvas with printed bars, stars, and emblems. Next slide, please. Uh, this object is an example of the challenges with which staff are presented when accessioning an object in non-archival quality mounts. Next slide, please. Those challenges include, if the flags are removed from its mount, will the staff have to contend with flags adhere to the backer board and thus must apply more involving and expensive conservation measures. Will the object then require flat storage, as in the large cabinets pictured on the slide? But if the objects are maintained as is, the staff will not be able to conduct a thorough inspection of their condition and decide the next steps for storage and preservation. Further, what if any conservation may be necessary due to the damage the flag suffered during use? Leaving the object sprain precludes conservation. Will leaving the flags in the framing while leaving the flags in the framing may give a positive impression that the objects are readily available for exhibition. The non-archival quality framing materials may be physically harmful to the objects, threatening their preservation. 
As in many other instances, there are often conflicting decision paths that the staff has to make. Next slide, please. Second on the list of historic flags for today is a United States national flag from the 82-foot U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Point Slocum, called number 28313, one of 79 of the point class. Twin diesel engines gave the cutter an 18-knot speed, and an air-conditioned interior proved very popular when 26 of the cutters were sent to Vietnam to execute Operation Market Time during the war. The Point Slocum was commissioned in 1961 and originally home ported in the U.S. Virgin Islands. In 1965, she was made part of the Coast Guard Squadron 1 to support Operation Market Time. Next slide, please. Oh, if you could go back one, my apologies. I have the arrows there because those two things will uh, be important and, and uh, mentioned in just a moment here. Next slide. The flag you see displayed was flying aboard Point Slocum in an armed action on 20 June 1966. That day, cutters Point League and Point Slocum, along with Point Hudson, assisted with the capture of a 125-foot People's Republic of China trawler near the mouth of the Cochian River in South Vietnam. During the three to four hour engagement, the trawler was, was eventually run aground, caught fire, and as you saw in the earlier photo, both cutters pulled alongside the burning trawler and directed fire hoses on the holds that were full of ammunition. The crews of the cutters were also kept busy battling the enemy aboard the trawler along the shore. Next slide, please. You can observe the battle damage in the field of the flag from shrapnel or flying debris from the hostile fire. In the end, about 250 tons of military stores on board were eventually able to be retrieved from the trawler. Commanding officer of the Point Slocum was awarded a rare uh, Silver Star Medal for this action. This flag, while in generally good condition, presents the staff with the decision on what, if any, stabilizing measures may be necessary due to the battle damage and any possible contaminants from the smoke, from the, from the smoke and explosive residue uh, suffered during the uh, engagement. While the number one option for flag storage is keeping it completely open and flat, the size of this flag may preclude that option. As a result, the flag may need to be folded using soft internal supports to relieve stress on the folds. Rolling the flag on a support tube would be better, but we'll cover that in a minute here. Next slide. Oops, my apologies. This is what you don't want to do, okay? You don't want to roll it and stuff it in a tube someplace. You might have to fold it, and so you want to have internal supports, and that's what the uh, right-hand side shows. Next slide, please. The third flag from the collection is a foreign flag from World War II. And we talk, part of the Marshall Islands is an atoll in the Pacific, just north of the equator, and was considered a strategic target during the war. Marines and Army infantry, supported by members of the Coast Guard, endeavored to capture the atoll, from the occupying Japanese in mid-February 1944. This included the island of Ngebi, which is part of the atoll. The fight for possession of the island was devastating, with only 19 surrendering out of the over 1,200 Japanese, Okinawan, and Korean personnel that were on the island. During combat, Marine communications specialists took heavy enough casualties to require U.S. Navy and Coast Guard support personnel to help. Some of those volunteers pictured can be seen holding a Japanese flag taken on Ngebi. A few years ago, a friend of one of the volunteers came to own the flag and offered it for inclusion in the U.S. Coast Guard collection. The family of flags to which this particular specimen belongs was a very popular war souvenir and thousands were taken home by Allied members. These very personal flags served as what is known as best wishes or good luck flags. It was traditionally presented to a man by family, neighbors, fellow workers, classmates, etc. Uh, prior to his induction in the military were being deployed uh, for the war. Most often using the Himomaru or the Japanese national flag, which is the red disc on a white field, well wishers would write on it their names, good luck messages, slogans, or exhortations for the military member to do well in battle. This flag, however, is the raised sun flag used mostly by Japanese naval forces. And I want to point out different pieces of damage, because I'll show that in just a minute. When written on and around the central disc, the flag is called Hinomaru Yosegaki. To write sideways around the sun is more or less the translation of that. The observer may notice photographs of these flags typically depict what Westerners consider the, the reverse side of the flag. That's the, the side that the writing is typically on. Keep in mind, traditional Japanese writing is read from right to left, and books begin from what Americans would consider the back of the book. So therefore, they tend to show what we call the reverse of the flag. A very personal artifact, the flags offer tangible representation of the hopes and wishes of family and friends to help the owner through the tough times, and overtly a reminder for the soldier to do his duty. The writing, most often in ink from a brush, usually flows outward from the disc in a ray pattern, but any configuration is possible. 
Banners exhorting good luck are typically executed in large characters across the top. Medium-sized characters normally running vertically down the right or left-hand margin in one, two, or three columns are most often the names of the recipient and the individual or body presenting the flag. This flag varies somewhat by having the names appear at the very bottom. It may be this flag was meant for two brothers from the Minami family. Uh, the first characters, the family names, are match, and the name is fairly common in Japan. Something difficult with Japanese given names is that the kanji characters may often be read many different ways, so it is difficult to say for sure who the two brothers really were. Using a common approach, however, a best guess would be Shigeru Minami and Fusano Minami. There is no indication on the flag as to their hometown or other modern prefecture or any other clue to help identify them. I'll mention why that's important in just a moment. Next slide, please. The obvious damage to the field of the flag was unexplained in the background provided when it was offered to the Coast Guard. As evidenced in the World War II archive photo that you just saw, the damage is period and appears to have occurred while the flag was folded. Up to about 1930, these flags were often made from silk, cotton of various weights, and of a synthetic called rayon. Towards the end of the war, with fabric at a premium, they were also made from a hemp-like material. The red design is usually screened or imprinted in the field. With the field of this particular flag in generally good condition, despite the World War II holes, does the curatorial staff have the option to use rolled storage if flat storage is a challenge? Rolled storage is depicted on the right of the slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. Further, do the various writing uh, inks that were used when people would add their uh, message uh, present a conservation challenge since they may cause de deteriorization of the textile material itself? Should these considerations cons dictate flat storage to lessen the ink's potential deleterious effects? These, again, are amongst the many questions staff members must consider when preparing the flag for preservation and storage. Next slide, please. Since the flags are personal possessions of specific individuals and not military issues, a somewhat recent phenomenon is the effort to return good luck flags to Japan. As alluded to earlier, this may be a project fraught with difficulty. For example, just as in the U.S., there are many common family names, and unless there is something else in the flag to help distinguish the individual person, it may be impossible to identify them. As you can see from this slide, there are occasional successes celebrated when a very personal artifact completes the decade-long journey home. This is the nephew and his wife of the individual Japanese soldier that the uh, two flags were issued to. Next slide, please. The fourth flag selected provided an opportunity to conduct a short bit, uh, but enjoyable piece of vexillological scooping. I told you I'd work today. <laughs> <laughs> a private individual offered the historian's office an historic object identified as a Civil War era quote unquote revenue cutter flag. If accurate, the flag would be something quite rare and special. At first blush, the object could very well be an example of that flag, more accurately described as a cutter's ensign. But was it really? The auction house invoice issued with the flag described it as a, quote, unquote, a United States revenue cutter flag circa 1860 to 1870, unquote. At no small expense, the large and beautiful four and a half by seven and a half foot flag had been professionally conserved, mounted, and framed using archival materials, making quite a visual statement. Next slide, please. You'll see it here in relation to two full-grown adults. During the accessioning review, Coast Guard curator, questioned enough of what she found to delve further. Upon its establishment in 1790 by Congress at the urging of the Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, the Cutter Service required a symbol of its unique authority. And pursuant to the 1799 Customs Administration Act, the Treasury directed distinguishing ensigns and commissioning pennants. The ensign was described as 16 perpendicular stripes, alternate red and white, the union of the ensigns be the arms of the United States in a dark blue on a white field. The design 16 red and white stripes reflect the practice at the time of matching the number of stripes on the flag to the number of states in the union. The, the design stuck even after the national ensign returned to 13 stripes. The same flag was also flown ashore at customs houses and now serves as the flag of the U.S. Customs Service. In 1915, the Cutter Service was amalgamated with the Life Saving Service and became known as the U.S. Coast Guard and granted an ensign which differs from the U.S. Customs flag by adding the Coast Guard emblem on the striped field near the fly. The flag donation research project began with a document review and contact with a representative of the auction house. Because the subject specialist who cataloged the, left, the flag had already left the company there, and there were no uh, condition reports in its archives, no new insights were gained by that interview. 
But the flag field of 16 alternating red and white vertical stripes are obviously correct for the 1860-1870 period. Also, the pattern number and the general layout of the stars in a single arc above the eagle in the canton appears to match others identified for the period. The color and pattern of the eagle, arrows, branch, and escutcheon, however, are problematic. Research on representative flags of the period show them in a dissimilar canton, with a dissimilar canton. The contemporary U.S. Navy reference for the maritime flags of the period does not show raised eagle's wings for cutter flags until the 1899 version. Considering manufacturing techniques next, the flag is completely machine stitched with wool bunting stripes. Its cotton muslin stars are appliqued with zigzag stitching. The eagle is double appliqued. No documentation was available indicating whether the stars are doubled up or sewn on and then cut out on one side to show through. The framing limited the ability to check that out. While period flags could have machine stitch stripes, they likely did not have machine stitch stars. They were typically uh, hand sewn after the rest of the flag was made, much less with zigzag stitching. The zigzag machine attachment was apparently available late in the 1860s, but is not usually found, found in flag making until the 1890s. The conservator's report indicated the use of a cotton header and metal grommets. Both are potentially correct for the 1860s. The auction house dis description indicated the grommets are of brass which was supported by visual inspection. Early metal flag grommets were of steel, and while grommets were used during the Civil War period, they were not, however, common until the centennial, some 10, years, 10 or so years later. Brass grommets became more common in the 1880s, and grommets were almost exclusively made of brass by 1890. More and more, it appeared the flag was not Civil War era. The object was one more, excuse me, the object has one more source of information that can be most helpful with dating a flag, a maker's mark. While some flag manufacturers used maker's marks in the 19th century, they were not common until the 20th. Stenciled in black on the obverse of the header is the maker's mark, U.S. Flag and Signal Company, Norfolk, Virginia. It was not difficult to find a company with the same name that still exists today. During a telephone interview with the company vice president, he said the company was established in 1920. While there are, while, while there are no extant early company records, Mr. Capps, the uh, vice president, related that most stenciling he has seen on early company flags tends to be in red ink and usually includes the company location and a logo of cross naval flags, signal flags specifically, possibly a U and an S. He also mentioned, however, that it is possible the stenciling was done in black as with this flag. Based on aggregation of the information discovered, centered on construction methods and the maker's mark, validation of the flag as a revenue cutter flag was not possible. Uh, the flag is most likely a U.S. Customs Service flag from the 1920s or later, but it certainly precedes the change in the Canton in 1951, in which the arc of the stars is replaced by the glory. Seen above the eagle's head in uh, modern renditions of the Great Seal, you can see it on the $1 bill. While a revenue cutter connection could not be confirmed, the flag is still a wonderful addition to the collection and is presently on display in Coast Guard headquarters in the complex. This flag is not only a rare example of its type and era, but rare as an accession to the collection. The flag and its conservation have already been professionally documented. It is mounted in archival quality uh, materials, and the mount perm permits long-term exhibition and later storage in an upright position if uh, storage space is, is limited. Oh, well, I'd love to get more of those. Yeah. 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 For the last flag today, next uh, slide, please. Oops, sorry more of the uh, conservation. Next slide. Okay. For the last flag today, we encounter an altogether different challenge from the others. Transferred to the Coast Guard in 2011 by the U.S. Navy, this hand-painted eagle flag is a mystery object in the collection. It arrived with no provenance and awaits further research and confirmation. Initial research has shown these types of flags, even with a white field, were popular in the 1800s and used on many merchant vessels, both inland and on the open ocean. Next slide, please seen in uh, period art uh, examples of what I was just mentioning. Relatively small and only painted on one side, close observation of the flag reveals pencil design elements indicating the flag may in fact be unfinished. But the design does show through somewhat to the reverse side of the flag due to the thin structure of the field. So the fabricator may have thought it unnecessary to paint the reverse. The eyes on the header are not metal, but hand whipped and without significant wear marks. Damage to the blue bar at the fly appears to be from age and possible insect activity by sexual use. But, the, but was the blue bar on the fly always there, or is it a repair to a damaged fly? 
closer inspection may reveal the answer. Counter to having to repair a, fr a frayed fly edge, is the flag's overall good condition. There are simply few indications of the flag being flown extensively. So if it was used, it was likely for a very short period of time. Its style and fabrication methods, as well as its component materials, point to a flag possibly produced in the mid-19th century. Could very well be Civil War era. Some conjecture centers on the object as a deception flag, quote, quote uh, used in inland waters by a Confederate vessel during the Civil War, or was it a vessel operated by the Union Army who did operate vessels during the period? Some have proffered the idea it was a revenue cutter service jack, a small identifying flag usually flown in the bow. So, with the Revenue Cutter Service being a predecessor of the modern Coast Guard, the Navy thought it might be better served in the Coast Guard collection and thus the transfer. Could this flag have indeed been used during the Civil War as a deception flag by a vessel in Confederate service and then captured by the Union Navy? Or could it have been a flag aboard a merchant vessel attempting to dodge custom fees and then captured by the Revenue Cutter Service? Therefore, the connection. There may be possible, there are many possible scenarios in the Coast Guard's territorial service that members continue to investigate any leads. As with any, oops, sorry, next slide. As with any example, uh, sorry, that's the close-ups of the uh, parts I was talking about with the uh, damaged fly and the uh, painted eagle. Next slide, please. As with the example flag shown on the left, a thin field and painted eagle emblem image on the flag dictate flat storage for this historic object. Its relatively small size enables flat storage in an even modest storage area, precluding the large flat and expensive and the storage cabinet shown on the right in the picture. Uh, the preferred method for large flags, if you can at all afford it and have the space. With proper physical archival support and coverage across the flag's field, this flag will continue to be available for research for many years in the future. Next slide, please. Okay. We're not going to do questions uh, right now. We're going to hold those to the end of both presentations. But the, uh, the wide range and types of flags and their condition present observers and researchers physical representations of Coast Guard history and challenge the Coast Guard's curatorial services staff in ensuring these historic objects endure for the benefit of future generations. I have two things I'd like to show you very quickly, though, as examples of what I was talking about. Uh, typically, with painted flags, you don't want to fold them. At minimum, you want them rolled because the paint that itself can flake off, particularly with stress uh, in the folds. And for modern flags made from uh, man-made materials, you have to be careful with their physical uh, uh, layout uh, as well as how they're either rolled or, or uh, folded. This is an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, this flag is 36 years old. Uh, if you come up close, you'll start to see how it's starting to uh, Man-made fibers are starting to separate and uh, deteriorate. Uh, part of it most likely because of the stress of being folded. Uh, there's different color of one side to the other because of the way it had been stored originally. And uh, mea culpa, this is the flag that flew over my detachment when I got commissioned uh, 36 years or so ago. Uh, it was given to me when I left. It has been this way the entire 36 years. I just found it six months ago in a in the trunk down in the basement when I was looking for something else. Uh, and this is not what you want to do with any flag. But <laughs> <laughs> you want to keep forever, or at least uh, if it's historically important, which this is not, but uh, you don't want to do these kinds of things. Uh, and you want to take uh, uh, care, uh, as I've mentioned during the presentation, to ensure that these things, uh, which are fragile, uh, stick around for others to use uh, uh, down the road. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stan. And yes, I forgot a couple of things uh, when I uh, introduced Stan earlier. We will be taking questions about both presentations at the end. And also for those virtual participants, um, all virtual questions will be at the end. And uh, you can use the Q&A feature um, to ask questions virtually. Um, okay, for our next speaker, um, we have Coast Guard Petty Officer Second Class, Lauren Laughlin. 
Uh, Lauren is a public affairs specialist stationed at the Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. Um, she served as the lead petty officer for three years where she used public media, blogs, and community outreach to tell the stories of cadets, staff, and faculty at the Academy. She's currently serving in a detail um, as the Coast Guard Museum's acting curator. And she's performing many duties, including public museum tours, classes for cadets, um, public media outreach via Facebook and, and Instagram. Uh, but she's also been producing a lot of new exhibits and displays at the museum, focusing on gender and diversity in the US Coast Guard. And as a, her other duties as assigned, also overseeing museum security, collections, accountability, and preservation. Um, uh, Ms. Laughlin, she is working on her BA in history and her, and her certificate in museum studies from the Harvard Extension School. Um, she is also uh, secretary for the local chapter of the Coast Guard Enlisted Association and a proud mother to her daughter, Rory, and two doggies. Please uh, welcome Coast Guard Petty Officer Second Class Lauren Laughlin and her paper entitled Save the Unicorn. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, unlike Stan, I did not bring the unicorn float. Um, <laughs> we will not fit in here with it. So thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, go ahead and get started with Save the Unicorn. So the Coast Guard Museum where I work, it's located on the Academy campus. Um, it's, it's beautiful. It's um, the ex exhibition space for the Coast Guard Heritage Assets Collection and home to more than 7,000 artifacts. Um, being where we are, we get a lot of drop-in visitors um, and uh, a, a lot of um, guests come in um, consistently. So the oldest artifact is a Japanese sword, while the newest artifact is a seven-foot unicorn uh, float from the 2020 Coast Guard Kindle Shark Attack. <laughs> So um, last year, the Coast Guard Cutter Kimball, which is homeported out of Hawaii, was in the Pacific when the CEO decided, let's have a swim call. So bring out the barbecue pit, cornhole, and people jumped in the water. Um, being the Coast Guard, though, we had a small boat on site for any emergencies of people in the water, and we also had shark watch, um, which is really good because, as some of y'all know, a shark showed up. So let's go ahead and play the video and see what happened. Oh, okay, maybe it did start there. Sorry. There is a fire in this video. So you can see our unicorn.
somebody their um, Oscar qual, so they pulled a man overboard drill, used the unicorn as a man overboard float. Um, this video went from the Coast Guard Cutter Kimball to the Coast Guard uh, social media pages. It then went viral. Do you want to hit the next slide? Thanks. So um, it went to social media pages, then it went to Coast Guard memes social media pages, mm -hmm. and share, 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 it was on news, it was late night shows. Um, the video that we just watched ended up having more than 10 million views within two weeks. It had accumulated over 500,000 likes on social media, on Coast Guard social media. It had more than 200,000 or 20,000 shares. Um, this is a video, or this is a picture of the only um, injury from the shark attack. As you can see, he scraped his knee getting up the side of the boat on a shark tattoo on his knee. So we're gr very grateful that um, nobody was injured. Um, as we saw this social media frenzy, we watched it from the museum. We were watching it with headquarters. We were watching it all. I mean, it was, it was a huge thing. Um, go to the next slide. Um, we started seeing things, uh, comments, save the unicorn, um, <laughs> you know, glad everybody's safe, including the unicorn, um, glad the unicorn was saved, save the unicorn. We kept seeing this and um, we said, you know what, let's save the unicorn. <laughs> and so we did. Um, head curator Jen uh, Gaudio went ahead and she called the CEO of the Cutter after discussing it with other members of our Heritage Assets team said, you know what, the unicorn is a great example of a modern day artifact that shows the active daily life of Coast Guardsmen. Um, it's fun, people want it saved, so let's save it. <laughs> so um, we reached out, the crew was excited to send the unicorn. They signed the bottom of the unicorn, stuck it in a FedEx box and shipped it to us. Uh, there's BM3 Taylor with the unicorn float. You can see how large it is. So Taylor is 6'2", so that lets you know how large this unicorn float is. Also, I have to give a shout out to Taylor because he's been the one who's been blowing it up. <laughs> <laughs> so as soon as we got it, um, commands around the museum, commands from headquarters wanted to see it. They said, oh, we want to, you got the unicorn float, let's see it. The media showed up, they were like, we want to see it, and we can't give them this deflated unicorn, <laughs> so we had to blow it up. Then it was, well, where are we gonna put it? Next slide. So um, at some point, this is it blown up in all its glory. We have it standing, um, it's actually on top of another display case. It's about five feet in the air at this time. Um, but as you can see, there's no security. So we would come around the corner, people would have their hands on it. Um, we would come around the corner, people would be touching it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these were other parts where we tried to put the unicorn. At first, it was right outside our office on a bench. Um, as you can see, that's what happens if Taylor doesn't blow it up weekly. She starts to get a little sad. Um, at, on that bench, it was not ideal, but it was where we could see it from the office. And having so many visitors wanting to see this um, artifact, we needed it within eye vision. Um, we tried putting it up where you just saw, so that's a cadet standing in front of it. Um, not that high, no security. Um, we then put it in a flat bottom boat that was used to rescue people during Hurricane Katrina, and it's behind a partition. And even being behind a partition, we still had issues. Um, when people come into the museum, they want to see the signatures on the bottom of the unicorn because they know somebody or they know somebody who knows somebody but they want to take selfies with the face of the unicorn. So it was like, okay, how can people look at the bottom, take a picture with the top and not touch it? So these are, and we have to blow it up weekly. 
Next slide, please. <laughs> These are reenactments. This is actually a unicorn float that my kids use at the beach. Um, you can see we put the unicorn float up at the top. Um, this is Taylor reenacting some of the issues that we've had in the last year. Um, we can hear people in the museum. We come out to greet them. They're hugging the unicorn. They're touching the artifacts. <laughs> Please don't touch the artifacts. Um, or in one example, I came around the corner to greet a group of people I could hear in the museum, and a coach from the academy had the unicorn upside down in his hands and was showing the signature of some former um, of some <laughs> former sports players who were now instant on the cutter and had signed it. And this was the second time I had had to ask him not to touch the artifacts <laughs> without gloves, without permission. And, um, you know, he is a respected member of the community and has the artifacts upside down. Um, another time I came in, um, opened the museum, did my first round, and the unicorn was gone. And admissions, um, one of the admissions officers had taken it and put it over in the corner. And he said, you can't take artifacts. <laughs> you can't just move the artifacts. Um, so that's when we decided we put out signs. <laughs> signs work most of the time. Um, and so now uh, we've made a cradle out of some really strong um, fishing line to get her in the air. So the unicorn is now seven feet up in the air. Um, this was just a temporary um, what to do to get it where people couldn't touch it. Seven feet in the air seems to do the trick. People can see the bottom, people can see the top. Um, but speaking with Janet, Arlen, Scott, we've also decided um, that we need to do a more um, cotton-based cradle. However, um, that would then cover some of the signatures on the bottom, which is what people want to see. Um, next slide. So. There she is, up in her glory. <laughs> We've made a bit more of a cotton-based cradle, at least um, covering. Um, we still have to pull out a six-foot ladder weekly to climb up and blow up the unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> um, but people love it. Um, even this past week, I had the vice commandant come into the museum, and when she turned the corner and she saw the unicorn, she said, oh my God, get my picture with the unicorn. <laughs> Four star admirals to, you know, um, cadets who are interested in coming to the academy have seen the video. They know this artifact and they want their pictures taken with it. So um, these are some of the issues that we're facing. Next slide, Anthony. Um, so we're looking for ideas. Like, seriously, anybody have any ideas of what they can do? Um, we've done research. We can't find any other inflatable artifacts on permanent display in a museum. Um, there are some inflatable toys at toy museums, but they are deflated. Um, there are sometimes some promotional items that are blown up. I've seen life-size blue whales in like natural history museums, but it's a promotional thing and they also have a nice budget to buy a generator to keep that well blown up. Um, I don't have a generator. I currently have a BM3, but <laughs> if he goes off of Adolf orders and soon it'll be. Um, we've tried different pumps. We've tried different um, pumps, hand pumps, bicycle pumps to pump it up, but getting seven feet in the air using a bicycle pump doesn't work that well. Um, and we are now, after just six months of it being in its cradle, are starting to see some, some bends in the plastic. So what can we do? These are, these are items that um, we're thinking about constantly. Um, next slide. So the <laughs> Taylor playing around. This is not the unicorn float. Yeah. This no is the, no this artifacts is were hurt. In this. <laughs> yes, there are no artifacts were hurt in the making of these pictures. So this is us just having a little fun. That is the um, the mask from the horse vessel whenever we received it from the Germans. I say we received whenever we took it kindly from the Germans in 1945. So we had to put the um, unicorn under the eagle for a little bit. Um, thank you. That is the end of my presentation. If you do have any ideas, I would love to hear um, because we um, obviously see that this item is going to need to be around for a while as an artifact on display.
So any help would be um, be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, PA2 Laughlin, and thank you, Colonel Contratus, for both of your presentations. We're now going to go to questions and to uh, the moderator, Scott Price. Yeah, I wanted to say just a couple of quick things. Uh, is she, that okay? Yeah. You're the boss here. No. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So I bet the artifacts lecture was on everybody's calendar all week long, right? Yeah, well, especially the unicorn. <laughs> See, okay, you were right, Lauren. Hi, my name is Scott Price, Chief Historian. Um, I've been since acting since 2015 when I got the job in 2016. My predecessor was here, Dr. Robert Brown. Um, he, when he retired, he chuckled as he went out the door. Look, I get it now. <laughs> Um, thanks for that, by the way. When you're a chief historian, you've actually, I run a museum, I run an artifact program, and I run a history program, an oral history program, I got a website it, it, with eight people. Um, it's amazingly difficult and challenging, and I've got some wonderful folks that work with me. But I wanted to special shout out to our volunteers. Captain Larry Hall, who also works at the Exhibit Center, and he comes in once in a while to help us at that. <laughs> <laughs> And Stan, my goodness, you've turned into a wonderful pre presenter and, and professional, and, and you, I loved your presentation. That was just great. Thank you. But like Janet said, we couldn't do what we do without it. We just don't get the support. Uh, and coming into the, as a historian, I know history pretty well. I know how to do history. I know how to go to archives. I know how to do research and how to write. I don't know anything about artifacts. I had 10 months volunteer at a museum in Omaha, Nebraska on the Strategic Air Command. So those artifacts were pretty gargantuan, <laughs> and they don't have the same concerns that they do with our collections, which is, Janet pointed out, almost 23,000 heritage items divided between the two areas. Um, so what we found is that Janet and Arlen Danielson, who just left the curator, and then this Jen Gaudio, who is the curator at the Coast Guard Academy, but she's, getting, she's retiring soon, and so Lauren has been with us helping. They've trained me in the importance of artifact handling and care and preservation, something that we have to remind every flag officer who calls up and wants something new for their office anytime they come in. And as you do your time in the Navy, you're going to find out every two to four years, there are going to be new leaders coming in, and you got to train them all over again. So Janet and, and, uh, and the gang have taught me how to handle these artifacts. And I wanted to say, Stan, your presentation, great overview. Um, but I think we could actually use that to demonstrate the flag officers when they want to decorate their office or their, their quarters on why don't really use heritage items, especially these flags. And for the United States Coast Guard, unlike I think the United States Navy, flags are incredibly important to us. Um, back before we had the stripes on our cutters, that flag that you demonstrated was our sign of authority so that you, when you saw a ship, with the, the customs ensign, um, you knew that it was actual cutter. So, and thank you very much. Now, when it comes to this, the uniform, um, I don't remember the exact details. My life is too crazy at headquarters. But as I recall, did you call me or Jen? Somebody texted me. Jen. And, yeah, Jen. And so we, we got into a discussion about, really? A floaty unicorn? Well, have you seen the video? No. All right, so I watched the video. <laughs> what happened? And then suddenly public affairs starts calling me. Headquarters, public affairs, because of all the media interest that this thing is gathering. And I'm like, oh my God. The head of Coast Guard Public Affairs called me into a meeting. You know, well, what are we going to do about this? <laughs> Apparently, people were not happy at the leadership. But if you look at the number of hits, that thing got 10 million views. Over 10 million views. You know, so anytime. Like when I'm dealing with people of my generation, you know, you've got to listen to the younger folks. We need to collect this uniform. We need to get it. Now we've got the problem that Stan would point out, preserving it. How, and Lauren, you did a great job. It was a great job with the whole presentation. But I mean, the thing's made out of 
plastic and you got to blow it up and it's under lights and it, you know, it's important, but so anyway, fantastic job, <laughs> you and Jen and the gang, you know, and, and I'm glad we did it. Although that chewing out I got was pretty intense. <laughs> Apparently that was violating some policies, firing too close to folks. And I'm not sure exactly. And the fish and wildlife service was outraged. How dare you scare a wild animal, <laughs> <laughs> but they were, Actually, we got an email from one of the head agents for the, the wildlife service said, thank you for saving the uniform too. <laughs> it all worked out. It was fine, but it was just amazing. So it's been a learning experience for me and I've got to thank my staff and Janet, especially who takes such good care of our collection. Uh, and Stan, you know, those, your, your stuff is absolutely fascinating. And as I said, flags are important to the Coast Guard, especially now, it, also to the Navy too, but as a symbol of our authority, you know, the one you did from, although, dang it, I wanted it to be from the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but thank you to my staff and thank you to our volunteers and, and thank you all for such a great job. So we'll open it up for questions. Um, Denise. Yeah, uh, she asked the question of what to do with it. So I have a question for you then. Uh, so hi, Denise Hoffman, I'm from the Naval Neighborhood Senior uh, But I'm also a former lobbyist, which is why I'm going to ask this where did they buy it from? I am not sure. So you want to ask where they bought it from because I just did a quick search. It's probably either Amazon, Walmart, or Target. Now I can guarantee if you make a quick phone call to their lobbyists and go, hey, we have an item that you sold that's now going to be permanently displayed. Can you help us? Yeah, they not love idea. that because the social media sales get is phenomenal. The director and me now is thinking legal issues. So I'll have to clear that through legal. This, I hate this job. So much. I know. You know who your key deck is? Is Melissa Bird, who's the former public. I know Admiral Bird very well. Yeah, she's she's uh, wonderful. Well, and I'm thinking that the company. I mean, they may display their toys in a way that we don't know about. Yeah. So they might. That's a great idea. They might have ways that they display it without necessarily air in it, but. You know, we're wondering if there's some other material that we could put in there. And if you don't go to them, go to Hasbro. Hasbro, okay. Thank you. That was a good suggestion. Yeah, that was, that was my thing. It's like, have you thought about filling it with an inert gas that's not yeah. there? So we've, we've thought about that, but the issue is um, it, it's leaking. Mm -hmm. uh, there's multiple um, breath valves or, or air valves on it. Um, unless we permanently sealed those, and then also, um, uh, no offense to the Kimball, but it's a cheap unicorn float. <laughs> like, you know, it's the same the one. The Coast Guard was are, cheap. No, <laughs> I'm saying it's a pool float. Yeah. So um, well, I know. We've, yeah. we've thought yeah. of um, gas. We've thought of some sort of other, like a silicone-based material that we could squeeze in to fill it. We thought of cotton, um, stuffing it full of uh, cotton batting. Um, that would then make it heavy. Um, then I would have to get thicker straps to hoist it up, which would cover up the signatures. Yeah, and um, I think a lot of these things too, I mean, they cost money. Um, and since we have accessioned this artifact into the collection, I mean, in theory, we are trying to preserve it forever and ever. I mean, way beyond our terms and our jobs for the Coast Guard. And um, conservators, are usually very creative people because they work on exhibit displays and preservation means all the time. And we need to reach out to a conservative, but conservators, uh, you know, charged by the hour as well. So a lot of what we're, we're dealing with too is, is a lack of, of funding. And my other thought was eventually the popularity of the thing is going to fade and then you can, you can fold it up and put it in a the proper box and and protect it from the light and all yes. that, and, and and use photographs or the video. Who was the youngest crewman aboard Kim? That's correct. Yeah. I'm, yeah. So, yeah. I'm just thinking, right? You got a <laughs> semen apprentice or whatever, 18 years old, so it will be in the news. It's on once it's online like that. Oh, sure. You know, uh, but that's yeah, eventually. Do you want to take over? Because you, you know, don't have to use the real one. You can have it, you know, preserved a replica, a replica, have a, have a replica <laughs> hanging up there and. Keep showing videos. And fake all their signatures. <laughs> Not fake the signatures. That's <laughs> photograph, you know. But but you satisfied the ability to get the picture taken with the unicorn. 
uh, for a while. Yeah, that's a good idea. Sorry, yeah. museum director kicked in there for a minute. Yeah, that's a great. <laughs> that's a good idea. Lieutenant Commander. But he does take pictures, like just display like a good photo. I mean, I think that often happens with like artifacts <coughs> and stuff. She got Admiral Fagan, the first four-star admiral of the United States Coast Guard, to get excited about an artifact. Female. First female, female. 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 under her. Department at the academy to give me cadets as a capstone project. That would that would serve, but usually the capstone projects are, are scheduled like two years out. So well, can't they bend the rules a little? I know. I was able to get engineering students to help with the Coast Guard lady uh, cards. <laughs> so I'm like, give me more students. Y'all are great. <laughs> Oh, Bill. Yes, sir. Dr. Uh, Thiessen. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> couple, couple questions. First of all, for um, Lauren, apparently has a gender. She, and does she have a name yet? Or? I know. I am sorry that I keep assigning gender to a non-binary unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually just wrote a paper about why we shouldn't refer to cutters as she's, and I keep breaking that rule with the unicorn. But she's so pretty. <laughs> um, no. So it it came out at first. It was lucky was a name that had been tossed up into the air. Lucky would be a name, and it would be joining the other mascots, such as Salty the Rabbit from World War II, um, the, the Rooster from the Pilots in Alaska, and a couple other mascot-related items that we have in collection. So. I had a question for Stan. Are there more flags in the collection that, uh, that you're looking at analyzing, like you have the ones that you presented? Yes. Uh, I'll be honest, really? I can't remember the number, but it, it, it's in the hundreds. Wow. Uh, flags, you, yes, flags. flags in the hundreds in the collection. Uh, many ensigns and national, U.S. national flags, a lot of uh, signal, even wigwag. We have some, <laughs> some of those as well. Uh, I think the next one, because I've, I've written on the one that's the, the eco flag, the uh, purported revenue cutter flag, the Japanese flag. Uh, and the point slocum, I think the point grace is probably going to be the next one. Uh, and that's even more damage than the uh, uh, point slocum from the engagement it was in. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, as I find them, I, I try to write Does the about them. Academy still have a number of the war trophies on display in the auditoriums, the British flags that we captured, they're still on display. Have you seen all those yet, Stan? No, in the, the main auditorium, I know. And there's, um, there's a number of them. Yeah, and uh, on display, and they have been forever and ever and ever. So, if know. they were there uh, 50 years ago when I came to visit, then I've seen them. Okay, I just we might want to <laughs> see how. Maybe they I, have I had some to thoughts. think of how long that was. So okay. they might have some thoughts too, because you yeah. talk about that battle damage. And, Absolutely. And, I mean, do you save the textile by eliminating the battle damage, or is the battle damage important part of? The history of the flag. So these are things yeah. that, that I'm still learning as a historian versus being a, a collections and manager. Some things you can. I say yes, yeah. obviously. Some things the conservator can arrest the the deterioration so it doesn't get worse. Right. Some things you just can't. And so uh, for I know there's uh, flags in various army uh, collections that have human blood on them. And because of the iron and other contents of the blood, it actually rots the, the, the textile itself. So you start getting these black rimmed holes in flags that you just, you know, what, what do you do about them? So, I mean, it runs the gamut. Uh, like I mentioned with the Point Slocum, you've got all the, the smoke and everything from the stack or, or you know, whatever type of you know, cutter it might have been, uh, plus the, you know, uh, explosive residue from all the action. It gets in the flag, even if it's not deteriorating the flag chemically, it can deteriorate the textile, the fibers, 
by by movement and by uh, friction. So there's all different kinds of things, which is why you want to minimize moving it, touching it, those kinds of things. Because you know they've been around. As I mentioned, this is only 36 years old, and look how bad it looks. Uh, uh, what do you, you want these flags to be here for the next hundred? 200 years and all those kind of things. So that's what the conservation and preservation like, like you mentioned is very important. Well, thank you for all your hard work on doing that, too. Love it. All right, Bob. Captain yeah, uh, yeah the, the, after like multiple decades in the Coast Guard, you probably know the answer to the question, but the unicorn brings up the thing because all of a sudden this item becomes uh, something that's identifiable with a point in Coast Guard history, right? It becomes something there. And the flags you saw, you know, the from the Carter in Vietnam, Carter in the Middle East. Um, is there is there a policy? I guess I should know. Is there a policy when uh, something something dramatic happens that is potentially historic in the Coast Guard that uh, the curatorial staff says we need? I mean, I know there's stuff for decommissioning ships and all those kinds of things, but is there is there a Coast Guard policy that says, hey, if this happens, you know, you need to contact us so we can tell you what we would like you to say. In the um, external affairs manual. Is it? But nobody reads it. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> 36 I, years in the Coast Guard, I never read that, uh, that particular yeah. policy. And I'm a history teacher. So but it's still, you know, it, it's uh, pretty impressive that, that with Dr. Thiessen's work and then with our website, and, and we're getting out there so people know that we're there. We, we did just finalize our scope of collections, which is a more specific document that states the, the heritage that we want to collect or that maybe we don't need to collect any longer, um, and what criteria we use for selecting artifacts. Um, but collecting the now is sort of a new, it's a newer thing in our field of work um, in some respects. And um, we've collected a quite a few, a couple things over the last few years that I've been there, like um, the MV Golden Ray that listed in, in the, was it Savannah River? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the Coast Guard was involved in um, the rescue of the folks that got trapped in the hull. And in doing so, they had drilled holes of, of about yay big around to make a square big enough to actually pull folks out. I mean, initially, the first hole was let's get some water and food down in there to keep people okay for a few days until we can actually get them out. But we we did receive um, one of the discs um, that they drilled from that hull, and we did accession that into the collection as an important representation of that of that rescue. And that was on the, the part of the Coastie that, that thought of it. So we're lucky in some respects that folks that go out into the field and do important work and, and a lot of you young folks that came in for the unicorn, um, you know, if you think of something and you think, oh, wow, this is like, this was really important event that happened or, and, uh, you know, reach, if you, if you know your, you have the Naval History and Heritage Clan, you can reach out to them. And then we have the, our historian's office. So we've been lucky in that respect that folks have thought about it themselves. Yeah, and then our staff's done pretty well documenting COVID and how the responses and so somebody suggested that i don't know do they do it here at the naval academy with signs up of you know wear a mask and don't wear a mask under your nose and all that stuff well we have a Douglas Monroe is our most famous coast guardsman who won the medal of honor earned the medal of honor died in battle at guadalcanal our headquarters building is called the Douglas Monroe headquarters building and there's a bust of them there so a public affairs person thought, why don't we put a mask on Doug? And they did the whole <laughs> series of be like Doug, don't be like Doug, don't be like Doug. <laughs> and the commandant, the vice commandant, and a few other folks signed it. So that's going to be a session. So it's that kind of a thing where people yell at us and say, why don't you do this? John? Yeah. I just want to just first say thank you uh, for up in the service. Uh, you see these artist renditions of uh, historical events, and then you never actually see anything. It's, you know, this etherical thing that, oh, okay, Coast East Point did things, but having that physical representation is huge. Uh, the, the second thing I would offer is uh, you've got plenty of Coast East out there at the deck plate level that are more than willing to collect artifacts. I have pieces of uh, low profile vessel halls, semi submersibles. You know, Coast East go out, they capture, <laughs> capture bad guys, 
passes the eye line for me. Yes, and uh, you know we have things like that. It references back to our, our history and heritage, uh, and a little bit more modern of the, the trucks and thugs era. I mean, part of our challenge is you know, I have two people running the whole accession program. Yeah. So you, when we've got the National Museum getting all the headlines, exactly. people are like sending us the session offers two or three times a day to the thousands. And I've got two people to handle yeah. that. So we, we, it's, a, it's a balance. And so we try to let folks know that, you know, we are going to we are going to get there. But that is a challenge. So you have a room full of you guys. Midshipmen. Mid Don't get that wrong. Maybe. But Coaster has a phenomenal website. And you are doing, especially with those pieces, amazing stuff on the diversity side. And on the accession side. So if you want to share maybe your website, like, like is it, it, I, I, I'm sorry, I just don't know what it is. But it is www. And by the way, you do want to look at USCG.history.mil. And if you go into Google, we made sure I called up what Sergi said, hey, people type in Coast Guard history, that our website gets up there. Yeah. And, and so, funny, kids, make sure you see Bill Jesus. He is doing amazing things on the diversity side. I don't give you a shout out for me, because you are. Yeah. Um, it, and it just, he's the visa. So, look, talk to him, okay? I'm so proud to know you, Bill. <laughs> 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 this is the reason. <laughs> oh, now you got a little. There we go. Sam, man, you've got hidden talents. I tell you, the Air Force must have done something. Like <laughs> From me to you, Bill. Is that a session policy a comment section? How do we get no. access to it? Because I am always looking at stuff going, oh, I wonder if they'd want that. I wonder we, if they'd want that. Oh, yeah. Well, we're going to put it on our website. We will, yeah. yeah. We're just we're rebuilding the dang thing. You know, okay. Yeah, like so I've got so many people like you. Know, e me. Email me. Email me. Oh, there already is yeah. a comment on instruction out there about our program. Yeah, it's the external affairs manual's basic yeah. document that runs on as a, and then uh, as we have the package. personal property manual, yeah. which is the authority by which we <coughs> have to keep our artifacts yeah. <laughs> inventoried, and you know, you all figure this out. But as far as I know, we want it to do appendix or a new chapter. Whoever right, yeah. and then tagging something as heritage, and, and then yeah. all the wonderful bureaucratic things yeah. that happen. I'm sure that maybe it's probably even worse. I mean, they have decommissioned policies that I just got a hold of. That are pretty extensive too. Yeah, I yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. <laughs> um, any other questions? Fun seeing so many even shipping come in. Thank you all. Good luck in your careers. Yeah, so and we have no so online good. questions. Yeah. Well, that's up to. I'm sorry, I didn't in, didn't say thanks to our ensign, who's again helped us, and he's yes. working well with the United States Coast Guard. <laughs> I know we're a little unorthodox, so I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, I'm done talking, so this is your, this is your session. So Some of the missing came in after, after the... Yeah, yeah. they didn't. Oh, if y'all want to see the... the okay, that's okay. a yes. Okay. Okay. Right. We'll forgive them for being late. <laughs> Can you play the video, play the video again? Keep my squash. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, for the midshipmen who missed this, this is the Coast Guard Cutter Kimball in the Pacific. They were having a swim pull. If you haven't been on a swim pull, it's barbecue day. You jump in the water, you have some fun. Um, there's 20 to 30 people in the water when Shark Watch spotted a 10 foot shark that was headed towards the coast gate. Um, being Simper Paratus ever ready, we had a guy with a um,
for coming. We really appreciate it. Have a good day.